Um, you asked before, Kavork, is there a policy difference between uh, defeating Russia and mm -hmm. uh, not allowing Russia to win? Absolutely, right? It is a mistake to think of winning or losing as some kind of binary switch. Let me ask you, as a Syrian, who won the war in Syria? On the strategic level? <clears throat> so, yes, the U.S. regime change was prevented, so, right? Yes, it was prevented. Syria didn't win the war yet, but they have yes. foiled the regime change. Exactly. War. The U.S. military is still occupying all of East Syria. Syria's oil fields and wheat fields preventing the economic stabilization uh, and social stabilization of the country. Turkey is still camped out in North Syria with, I don't know, my last count, it's like 100,000 jihadis under arms on Erdogan's payroll, right? Yes. Um, this is the way that if we're lucky, the conflict in Ukraine ends, not with some grand deal, not with some surrender. The Kiev regime will never surrender. Right. They they they're not going to sign. This is not some World War Two era where everyone sits down and signs a nice peep of paper. And we have a Tehran conference to, to hmm. see who gets what. It's it's not going to be like that. They will never sit at the table with Russia, not the West and not Kiev. Right. Just like in Syria, the best thing that you can hope for is a frozen conflict. Hmm. Um, this idea that. This is going to end with Poland taking part of Ukraine and Hungary taking the other. This is nonsense. This is actually Russian propaganda, right? Or Russian fantasies um, uh, trying to divide. The U.S. controls NATO. They control Europe. And while there might be a few nationalists in Poland and Hungary and whatever receptive to those ideas, they will never be allowed to do this because it would completely destroy the entire Western narrative around this conflict and their own role in the world. Um, they may de facto have a large amount of control over a Ukrainian rump state in West Ukraine when this is over, but they will, there will be no annexation uh, of territory that the, the wet, if that's the way it ends, the West will will only consider whatever Lavov rump state or whatever as the legitimate Ukrainian government, right? And we'll we'll have something that looks more like the Korean armistice, uh, hmm. if we're lucky. But now I, I have to I have to uh, disagree here, uh, and this is uh, comes from the as the uh, basically the uh, really very strongly emphasized point. And uh, you can uh, trace it through Lavrov about a week or so ago. And actually, Mr. Putin, in uh, his interview with Tucker, he, is talk he spoke about it. There is a quote which I pre present all the time when the question comes up, you know, about this whole situation. And he says that it is up to uh, United States, combined West, United States. Nobody cares about what Euro Europeans think, actually. So it is about uh, uh, how they decide how they want to lose with some dignity or and here comes this most important part, uh, part about what Medvedev says. And don't forget who Medvedev is. He is not some boy on the Telegram channel. He's former uh, president of Russia, and he's the secretary of the uh, Security Council. He is the guy who is deputy of Mr. Putin in the council which makes decisions. Hmm. And this is about that, you know, uh, Kiev is a Russian city. <laughs> so, and if it comes down, the uh, issue here is very simple. Political objective is well defined. It has been spelled out extremely well. Removal of the Kiev regime. And it will be removed. And after that, either Ukraine will uh, exist as the rump state, or will it exist as some kind of confederation? It will be without, uh, uh, obviously, without the Western part, because Russia doesn't need Western part. Russia doesn't need the Lvov. And it's going to be under Russian control in terms of uh, whatever the government will be installed there. But uh, the regime, the regime is over. 
And one of the reasons it is over because obviously they cannot even negotiate with Russia because they prohibited it by, by, by themselves. It is written in the Ukrainian constitution. So, and uh, when you look attentively at what Russia has right now in the uh, operational strategic reserve, it tells you pretty much everything you need to know because there is uh, just the latest data uh, from the uh, December, uh, end of December 2023. There have been confirmed 486,000 volunteers alone. And then, as Putin himself stated, uh, Russia gets about one and a half thousand volunteers daily. Ask yourself a question why they are there and why there are all kinds of new divisions and formations are being organized. Obviously, they're not organized to just s s stay there. Some of them will go, obviously, into the new military districts, which have been uh, re-established, such as uh, Leningrad military district. But uh, most likely, it is the issue of their further occupation, which, by the way, even American uh, counterparts admit now. So, But there, uh, there will be no uh, regime in Kiev as it exists now. And that's the whole point. It's been already spelled to the West. Uh, one way or another, you're going down, which is happening, by the way. And that's why I have to disagree with Mark that there will be uh, some kind of the American involvement. Involvement with what? That's the whole point. That, and as I already stated, to pre what's going to happen if they will begin to preposition forces? It's not even 1960s. Russia has a pretty darn good constellation on its own, you know, to see things which are happening there, let alone hu human intelligence. So, yeah, how they, um, uh, let's just to demonstrate to you, a uh, single uh, kilo class, we're not talking about Severodvinsk, single kilo class uh, submarine, which is the diesel electric submarine of the Northern Fleet. And uh, for it to actually, attack and destroy Bremenhaven uh, facilities with the caliber missiles, with the salvo of six or eight missiles, depending. It can do it practically without leaving the uh, Severomorsk naval base. Or it could be uh, could move into the, what it would be called the defended area of the operations, which is very safe from the, for example, NATO submarines, and it will launch from there, and nothing they can do about. And that tells you just, and this is just Bremen Howard. We're not talking about the operations and interdictions or interdictions on the shipping lanes of communications. And here comes the other thing. And do they want to lose their naval war? Because there is no U.S. Army in Europe without shipping lanes of communications. There is none. That's that's why if United States Navy wants to lose its major assets, guess what? They will, uh, uh, after that, they will uh, uh, basically escalate to the nuclear threshold. And this is the uh, basically the truth since who knows when, since the existence of the maneuvering battle, maneuvering groups in the uh, German, uh, uh, you know, German group, Russian group in the uh, Eastern Germany. They knew that I they could withstand it for like what, a week after that? official use of the tactical weapons, nuclear weapons, period. It exists exactly the same way. But that's the other issue. Russia doesn't need all that at all. Why would Russians attack Europe? Russians live beginning to live better than Europeans, you know. Why do you need this free load, you know, on your on your balance? I mean, to do what? So with them, and that's how the whole strategic uh, outlooks uh, outlook looks like, and that is why they're becoming hysterical. They're becoming hysterical. You look at the Macron. He is, I mean, the guy. His uh, uh, basic administration is burning. You look at Austin, the guy, I'm not even sure, I don't want to, you know, make uh, any kind of uh, uh, laugh, laugh at his uh, medical condition. It's a horrible thing, obviously, I wish him, you know, recovery and all that. So, but the guy is obviously out of his depth, as um, most of the uh, Biden administration. You look at Schultz, you look at geometrically challenged and Alina Baerbock, so, and... Uh, when you look at this, yeah, the only thing they do, it's all shaking of the air because they need to project something into their, uh, to, to, for their domestic purposes. 
And but then again, Macron is being a well, let me put it this way. The guy really thinks that he is that great. Yeah, he's delusional. I um I agree with Andre that uh the Russian goal now, it wasn't when this conflict started, but the Russian goal now is regime change in Kiev. And unless Russia takes his everything east and south of the Dnieper and removes the regime in Kiev, I don't think that I certainly won't. And I don't think the majority of the Russian people will consider it uh, a victory. And and Medvedev has been on this rhetoric. And I think Medvedev's rebranding as the new Zhirinovsky is all rather interesting. But I still have that video of a young Western admiring western leaning medvedev dancing absolutely idiotically to american boy burned into my head and i will never get that removed um so i i don't really trust this new medvedev uh that it's anything more than a rebranding and, and an act um so i um i think you really have to understand where the West, how they think militarily and politically and geopolitically to understand the end game here. Um, they consider, they've said it multiple times, right? They said that U.S. global leadership is on the line in the conflict in Ukraine. Their rules-based order is on the line. Russia cannot win. NATO cannot lose. They believe, and they have staked U.S.-led Western global hegemony on the outcome of this conflict. They, they, they cannot, they have to, again, we have to examine what our definition of, of winning and losing is at some point. Russia has known, at least since the end of the, the illusions that there was going to be any diplomatic settlement with the Istanbul processes, that this was going to end with a direct conflict with NATO. It didn't want that, but it knew that it's going to end that way. And it is going to end that way. And part of the reason why a lot of Russians, Russian military thinkers and so forth, political thinkers, they can't imagine that NATO would send forces into Ukraine. I mean, let's let's start with West Ukraine, uh, but into Ukraine in general, because they look at the alignment of military forces and they say Russia will eat them alive. The hmm. German military is a joke. The British military is a joke. They're mothballing ships because they can't meet their manpower requirements. The French military is a joke. The U.S. is a world away and overstretched uh, uh, around the world, right? And they're still trying to get a military Schengen through now to ease the transfer of hundreds of thousands of U.S. troops and gear through Europe. But you see that they are making preparations for this. In December, the former Ukrainian ambassador to London revealed that the U.K. has contingency plans for uh, an intervention uh, in Ukraine directly. Um, and we have heard um, uh, Ria Novosti break a report about three weeks ago, a leaked report showing uh, the British plan uh, presented uh, as uh, for a NATO expeditionary force to uh, Ukraine, which is absolutely insane. Uh, it, it It is... Uh, just ludicrous, uh, but I think everyone should read it nonetheless. Um, and now uh, we have these words from Macron, a number of the Baltics jump on, and everyone else is saying, no, we have no such plans. We don't have plans to send more troops than we have now. But we all know how, how uh, that changes. They are going to put troops into Ukraine at some point. As their panic and desperation increases, and Russians successes on the battlefield increase. Not now. There is no consensus now. But when Kharkov is under threat, when or maybe when Russian troops are moving on Kiev or Odessa, they will. And they will do it under the guise of peacekeepers 
or a no-fly zone to protect the still Kiev regime-controlled parts of Ukraine, right? Or some such, we're not here in combat roles, some such nonsense like that. Because they don't plan on fighting. They, at some level, some military people will tell them that they can't win that fight. The politicians won't believe it. They'll believe an American air power could, could you know, will will decide anything. But they, be, they will send the troops in quickly. The 101st Airborne is right across the border in Romania from Odessa. They've been waiting from 2022 from the order to walk across into Odessa. They will be there as a human tripwire force because they will count that Putin is more cautious, is more rational, and is more sane than they are, and will not attack NATO troops once they are on the ground in Ukraine. Of course, they are terribly, terribly wrong. And Russia will hit NATO troops, but they will be moved there. I'm Absolutely certain of that. And I think that Russia has reserved the greatest portion of its military force since 2022. It has it, it has, is raising this, shall we say, expeditionary force of volunteers very well. But they have always kept a very large reserve of their force at, for the contingency if NATO ends this directly. And all the signs are now. And with the revelations that Germany is saying, oh, We'll never send troops uh, to Ukraine. At the same time, we're getting recordings of German generals planning on launching 20 cruise missiles, Taurus cruise missiles, to take out the Crimean bridge. They're lying through their teeth out the other side of their mouth, right? They are not giving up. They will not give up. The Kiev regime will never surrender. These banderites that are really running Ukraine, the state within a state, as Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberally called Azov back in, in 20, uh, 2019, believe it or not. Um, they will never surrender. They will retreat to Lvov. NATO will move in there, if not before then. And then I don't know what happens after that. Because when Russia hits them, how quickly do we move to a nuclear escalation? I don't yes. know. But this does not end well. It does not end cleanly. It hopefully, and I think most likely, ends with a Russian victory. But as John Mearsheimer said, it's going to be an ugly victory. It's not yeah. going to be a clean victory like we, I mean, you, you can't expect forever for a best case scenario. Look, we, Russia won in Syria. The Syrian people won in Syria. Iran won in Syria. But what does Syria look like today? Yes. It's a mess. That's, well, I it's a mess. won't project a uh, uh, Syrian scenario onto uh, this is completely different set of circumstances, obviously. And uh, these are very different wars to start with. As yeah. Mr. Svechin wrote, his, Mr. Gerasimov loves to quote, to make the, to quote Mr. Svechin from his strategy that each war has its own character. It's a very unique, uh, each war. It's, uh, and you cannot simply project some scenario, even if you scale up, you know, using all those scaling coefficients, you know, and Pareto dis distributions, you know, to say, oh yeah, we can, no, we can't. It's, well, there are some things we can learn on the tactical and operational level there. That's why, for example, Russia rotated so many uh, leading uh, operational and strategic level officers through uh, Syria. But it's different. Uh, but at the point is, yeah, it's uh, uh, I kind of get where Mark is coming from. But yeah, Russia will hit NATO. Russians have no, you know, problems with. The, it, in fact, is uh, there, there is almost like mocking now of NATO that you are covered. Basically, you are sitting behind the, you know, the uh, backs of the, you know, can, uh, Ukrainian cannon fodder you uh, send to basically died there. So, uh, I mean, it doesn't matter if it's 82nd or 101st, whatever they, are, they have their, you know, battalion, or brigade, uh, the combat teams, uh, what have you, it's, they're not contest. 
you know, and uh, that's uh, the whole thing. Russia will take Odessa, I think, so now it's pretty much decided. It could be some kind of the, through some arrangement, but I also have to, and I usually don't do this, but it was John Mirschheimer who uh, quoted uh, Mr. Fukuyama about the liberalism defeating the uh, Nazi. Uh, Nazis, uh, and uh, also about the fact that Russia has a uh, pretty average, you know, insignificant force, which is nowhere near Americans, you know. So, yeah, I would be very cautious in terms of, with all my respect for John Mirschheimer, for his uh, counterpoint for, to this propaganda, but uh, I wouldn't put his military competences very high. And <laughs> so... Uh, it's not about ugly or not ugly victory. There's no such thing. You either achieve your political objectives and thus win the war. And again, victory is defined by the strategic and operational level. And uh, so uh, the question here is, uh, Russia already achieved one victory. Uh, what is left of the armed forces of Ukraine is a broken force. It's beginning to be uh, the, what is called sporadic Achigova, uh defense right now. And it will continue to be like this because they simply do not have manpower. They simply do not have the mobilizational potential anymore. And it doesn't matter. Fact is, uh, the slower it goes, the better, because essentially Russia already put NATO to the point of the untouchable levels of stocks. So when they begin to provide them uh, more, hey, be my guest, as they say. <laughs>